All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Greg Schoenberg from Litquake, and on behalf of the festival, I'd like to thank everybody for attending this um, very exciting and very weird edition of Lit Crawl. Um, tonight is the closing night of our festival. It's been running for the last 10 days. Um, and this is um, our first virtual Lit Crawl, which is I, about halfway through our 12 hours today, 25 events, seven different cities all around the world. We've got uh, authors in this one coming to you from cities all around the, the country. Um, this festival that we've been doing for over 20 years is nearly 100% free. Um, we couldn't do it without all of our donors and sponsors. Um, as you can imagine, it's harder than ever to do these now. So if anyone in attendance um, has, has the means to make a small donation, every dollar helps for us. Um, we can, you can hit us at Venmo at Litquake or PayPal, info at litquake.org, or just go, excuse me, go directly to litquake.org. Um, and just one more thing before we get started, after the event, there'll be a short survey that pops up. If you could fill that out real quickly, it'll take 30 seconds. Um, they're essential to our efforts to get funding and to keep Litcrawl free and hopefully back in the real world next year. So um, now let's get started. I'm super excited for this panel and I'd like to hand it over to Oscar Ziziva to get us started. Oh, thank you. Hello everyone, um, I am Oscar Villalon, I'm the managing editor of Ziziva. Thank you for checking out this, our Litcrawl event in celebration of our 35th anniversary with us, our five uh, contributors, Ziziva from uh, the past, recent and uh, in between. And I'm very, very happy to have them all here with us, even though we only have them for a little bit of time uh, to uh, read and to kind of give you all a sense of the sort of work that we've been doing in uh, Zizava these three and a half decades. Um, with us tonight are Jessica Hagenhorn, Carl Phillips, Anthony Mara, Charlie Jane Anders, um, uh, and, and Manuel Munoz. And uh, I want to start off tonight uh, by introducing Jessica Hagedorn. Uh, she's a novelist, playwright, poet, editor, and screenwriter. Born and raised in the Philippines, she came to the United States in her early teens. Her books include the novels The Gangster of Love and Dog Eaters, which is the winner of the American Book Award and finalist for the National Book Award, and is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. And she's also uh, edited the anthologies Charlie Chan is Dead, an anthology of contemporary Asian American fiction, and Manila Noir. Her fiction appeared in Zizova's third issue, Please welcome Jessica Hagedorn. Thank you, Oscar, and happy anniversary to Zuziba. Um, I am really thrilled to be here because Zuziba was the first magazine that actually published a piece of fiction of mine, which was this chapter I'm going to excerpt tonight from Dog Eaters. I was working on Dog Eaters at a, um, place called McDowell. I had my first residency there. I did not have a publisher. I was going from poetry to fiction and I was working on this book about the Philippines and it was such an affirmation to be published by this wonderful journal in San Francisco where um, I, I consider that city my second home in this country. Um, so I'm going to read this chapter, an excerpt, very short, called Heroin. Joey Sands, do you like it? Like a crooner, don't you think? That's where I got my last name, the Sands, a casino in Las Vegas. This old drunk fuck American was telling me about it. Hey, I haven't seen nothing like you since I left Detroit. He couldn't get over it, touched me when he got the chance. Did I have a daddy? Was my daddy an American? Shit, I laughed back at him, imitating his drawl. She it, man, I said, mocking him. You must be kidding. Man, I don't even have a mother. Laying it on real thick so he'd feel sorry for me. You're kind of young, aren't you? The American observed, but I could tell he was fascinated, just like all the rest of them. Joey Taboo, my head of tight kinky curls, my pretty hazel eyes, my brown skin. Where's the little GI baby, he'd ask Andres if I wasn't around. Andres would shrug in that bored way of his. He'll be here any moment now, I'm sure. The American would buy more drinks sitting close by the door of the bar. Sometimes I'd get there, let him buy me dinner. 
Sometimes I just stay away. Call me Neil, he said, his eyes fixed on me in that sad, funny way of his. It was one of his sober days. Neil, what kind of name is that? I love making fun of him. One time he asked me a favor for my buddy, some younger American guy named Phil. I did not like him as soon as I met him. Phil wants to see a live show. Phil is standing there, staring at me, not saying anything. You mean a sex show? I take my time drinking my beer, ignoring Phil's piercing gaze. Yeah, that's right, one of those, Neil is uncomfortable. You want boys, girls, or both? Maybe you want children. How much? It's the first and only time Phil the American opens his mouth. We drive down Rojas Boulevard slowly looking for the street. It's early around 11 at night. I sit in the front seat with Neil giving directions. Across the boulevard, I can see Manila Bay, black and still. Is that your ship? I point to the ghostly aircraft carrier floating in the middle of the dark sea. The American men don't respond. Uncle's waiting for us with Emiliano, the night watchman, hired by the congressman to guard his property from vandals and thieves. Uncle deals with me directly, talking in Tagalog and ignoring the two white men. He orders Emiliano to stay outside to watch the car after I tell Neil to give Emiliano some money. The abandoned Lido Supper Club, a white building. Statues of half-naked nymphs and goat men hold unlit torches. Uncle ushers us in through the back door. He looks for the main switch, stumbling and pointing his flashlight at the cobwebs on the walls. Finally, he turns on the dim chandelier that hangs in the room. A bare mattress lies dead center, a roll of toilet paper and a bottle of alcohol, rubbing alcohol, next to it. I leave the two Americans at the table, take uncle aside and tell him what they want. He has gone approximately 10 minutes. A skinny young girl enters followed by a well-built young man close to my age. She wears a flimsy, loose fitting dress, her eyes lowered. The young man is also barefoot. He wears torn khaki pants, nothing else. There are intricate tattoos of spiders and cobwebs up and down his sinewy body, a weeping Madonna tattooed across his back. He is beautiful. The two Americans sit up in their chairs, attentive now. I stay in the back of the room, smoking my cigarette in the shadows. This way I can watch them all, the two Americans, the young girl with her face turned away, the young man with the magnificent tattoos. All right, thank you so much, Jessica. That's lovely, thank you so much. I'm so, and I'm so happy that we, we were able to uh, be part of that, of that book's, uh, 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 well, I wanna yeah. say creation, yeah, but, but you know, the <laughs> helping to find an audience. Yeah. Um, uh, so thank you so much. I would like now to introduce our, our, our next reader all the way out there in Boston, Anthony Mora. He's the author of the New York Times bestselling novel, A Constellation of Vital Phenomena, which is the winner of the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Award. And it's long listed for the National Book Award and the story collection, The Czar of Love and Techno, which is a finalist for the NBCC's Fiction Award. His work has been honored with the National Magazine Award, the Whiting Award, and the Simpson Prize. And his fiction was published in Ziziba number 104. Would you please welcome Anthony Mora? How are you doing there, Anthony? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for uh, for um, putting this on, Oscar, and and um, to my fellow panelists. I've I've, I've read um, you all for for years, and it's a real honor to to share in your company this evening. Um, I just finished uh, writing a book uh, a couple of weeks ago, so I'm gonna read a page from it. It's um, set uh, in a B movie studio in the 1940s. Like most Angelinos, Artie Feldman came from somewhere colder and darker. First, the German-Polish borderlands, then Borough Park, Brooklyn, where a decade and a half after immigrating, he opened the unfortunately named Titanic, a Nickelodeon furnished with seats rented by the hour from a local funeral parlor. He expanded quickly, 
And in 1918, he telegrammed Wilhelm II to inform the deposed Kaiser that though his family had endured generations of persecution at the hands of the Prussian state, he was willing to offer the unemployed king an entry-level position at any of his nine picture houses. I can always use a fellow with managerial experience, he wrote the former head of state. But within two years, the Titanic met the same end as its namesake, and Artie fled to California to remake his fortunes in a land far from his creditors' lawyers. It was here that he and his brother Ned founded Mercury Pictures, a poverty row institution that for 20 years had produced squalid entertainments that passed over the eye without penetrating the brain. Like many a peddler of cheap thrills, Artie had a paradoxical relationship to his public, similar to the disdain and reverence with which politicians regard their electorate. Individually, each was beneath contempt, but taken as a whole, beatified by commerce, they transformed into the all-powerful, all-knowing audience, an omnipotence as mysterious and capricious as God, whom Artie cursed and implored and struggled fruitlessly to comprehend. Of late, there had been more lamentations than hosannas. To paraphrase Dalton Trumbo, as his pictures regularly did, investors were fleeing Mercury like shits from a sinking rat. In times of crisis, Artie sought refuge in the executive washroom, where that morning he dressed at the vanity in one of his signature cries for help. Tartan blazer, pink dress shirt, mustard necktie. He selected one of the six toupees that perched atop the uh, wooden mannequin heads on the vanity. It was irrational, he knew, but he'd come to believe that each hairpiece crackled with the karmic energy of the hair's original head, unrealized and awaiting release, like the static charge smuggled in a fingertip. Thus, he named his toupees after their personalities. The fighter, the Casanova, the Edison, the Odysseus, the Mephistopheles, and the optimist. The hair pieces were less fashionable than navigational, wired aviator caps guiding him through the dogfight to the landing strip below. Artie had never felt more at home in his adoptive country than when he learned the founding fa fathers had all worn toupees, even that showboat, John Hancock. The only one who hadn't was Benjamin Franklin, and look how he turned out a syphilitic Francophile who got his jollies flying kites in the rain. In about half an hour, Artie would lose his studio. Nevertheless, of the six hair pieces, he selected The Optimist. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, Tony. That's lovely. And when is that book coming out? Um, uh, probably uh, late, late fall, early, uh, early spring, uh, 2021, 2022. Thank you. Something to look forward to. Um, uh, our next reader I would like to introduce is uh, Charlie Jane Anders. She, uh, her latest novel is The City in the Middle of the Night. She's also the author of All the Birds in the Sky, which won the Nebula, Crawford, and Locus Awards, and Choir Boy, which won a Lambda Literary Award. Um, she is the author of a forthcoming uh, uh, young adult trilogy, Victory is Greater Than Death, being the first book, plus an upcoming short story collection, Even Greater Mistakes, as well as a collection of essays about how to make up stories during tough times, called Never Say You Can't Survive. Uh, her fiction was published in Ziziva's Bay Area Issue. Would you please welcome the hardest working woman in publishing, Charlie Jane Anders. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm gonna read from my piece from Ziziva's Bay Area Issue. Random memories overwhelm me when I venture inside the glam rock bar. Over here on this tiny stage, I did my first and last performance in the Friday night drag show, which was mostly trans women performing. We, I lip synced to an old Sheena Easton song about walls made out of sugar. Over there, some creepy dude grabbed my ass under my tiny pleather skirt and thong and demanded to know about the status of my genitalia. The back corner, with the long bench against the mirrored wall where I used to hide with five or six trans friends from the brat army, snarking about everything. And here, right here, by the women's room with the busted hand dryer, is where I met Wanda for the first time ever. They were playing an old 
Destiny's Child song, and something shifted inside me when I saw her long, dark hair, huge false lashes, and fuck everything smile. I can't describe the feeling in terms of a physical sensation, except that like there was this valve inside me that had rusted shut, maybe never fully opening since the end of adolescence, and suddenly someone grabbed a pair of pliers and yanked it all the way to the left. Something flowed that was warmer than blood and twice as oxygenated. My head floated. I felt Destiny's Child in the soles of my feet. We danced on and off surfaces with and without rhythm, eyes open and eyes closed until our hands became petals for our stamen faces. I couldn't believe Wanda actually wanted to go home with me out of all of the pervert stars in that place. Mouths glued together, hands on each other's elbows, grint grunting and giggling as we left, rolled around on my futon. But we also never really left the bar at all, or at least we always came back here. Every weekend and many weeknights, dating Wanda meant getting to know every filthy inch of this place. Our whole relationship centered on this one watering hole. There are places you go to get picked up or to pick someone up, but then if you spend enough time in them, you find yourself getting adopted instead. I told this to Wanda and she laughed. Sometimes the best communities come out of people just trying to get laid. I love that moment where we start taking care of each other instead of only wanting to fuck each other. It's true. Back when I met Wanda, I had so many lovers that I had no more bandwidth for all of their problems. Like Gravy was getting evicted and Jerry's bed frame shattered and Roxy was getting evicted and Susie's water heater broke down and ZQ was getting evicted and Frankie's truck was making a noise like one of those truffle sniffing pigs all the time. And also Frankie was getting evicted too. And I couldn't be there for all of them. So I just started networking them for each other like with each other. Like I got Frankie to replace the bed frame while Gravy fixed Frankie's truck. And also I was sleeping with a housing rights attorney named Trini who helped everyone fight their evictions. I basically became a referral service among all the people I was fucking. Thank you. Right. Now, beautiful. Thank you so much. And Trey, by the way, if you want to turn your mic on real quick again, because I just want to, you co-host the podcast. What is the name of that podcast? Our Opinions Are Correct. It's uh, ouropinionsarecorrect.com. We welcome your support. Thank you for mentioning it, Oscar. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Trey. Thank you. I muted myself, I'm sorry. Uh, Manuel Munoz, uh, he's the author of, of a novel, uh, which you see in the dark in the short story collections, Zigzagger and the Faith Healer Olive Avenue, which was shortlisted for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. He's the recipient of fellowships from the NEA, the New York Foundation for the Arts as well. And he has been recognized with the, with the uh, Whiting Writers Award, three O. Henry's, and an appearance in Best American Short Stories for his story, Anyone Can Do It, which was published in Ziziva number 113. Uh, coming to us from Tucson, I think I'm right about that, Manuel. Would you please give a warm welcome as much as you can uh, virtually to Manuel Munoz. Hey everyone, uh, welcome from the desert. I hope you're all well. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna read a little bit, but thanks to Ziziva for, um, for the story placement. Um, Best American changed my life, so I really appreciate it. This story is from my first book, it's called Astia. My friend Diego, because he was older, was tough. Not tough enough to live forever. When it was still rumor that a shotgun blast hit his left side, that he had flown from the back of a car, that he was riding a bicycle and not looking, it didn't matter. I was sad when I heard, only sure that Diego had taken the trip to the hospital, mumbling, gurgling blood, but not making it. When we were young, we played baseball in a clearing completely surrounded by peach trees. All the kids in the neighborhood, everything we owned, crude. The bases smashed chicken buckets. The ball ragged from a chewing dog. We owned the wooden bat not used anymore by the older kids. Heavy tape around the tip 
to keep it together. In that clearing where everyone ran circles, ate free peaches, it was Diego who did not mind picking me from the last of the bunch. And it was Diego who corrected my throw, got my stance right. He showed the rest of us and could shield the taunts. The day I heard about the accident, I thought of that baseball field and the day the bat gave me a splinter. Diego took me aside, letting the game go on, seeing the long splinter dug deep into my palm. He saw me crying and he pulled in over me like a wing to block all the joking. My hand tight in his, tighter when he pulled the pocket knife. With great care, my wrist in his hand, not letting me pull away the blade, he pierced my skin slowly and brought the splinter out, no blood. He made me kiss the splinter for luck, and then he blew it away into the grass of the clearing and our stomping feet. He made it better, Diego, who brought out both bad and good in us, made it surface without the expected pain when he held our hands and made us dig deep. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel. Um, wow, that, that's absolutely lovely. And I have to say, um, uh, it was such an uh, uh, honor and a pleasure for us to be able to uh, uh, publish uh, your, your story. And uh, uh, folks, if you haven't read it, please do. It's, it's, it's really astounding. We ran it and it was in our um, environmental issue. Um, so thank you again, uh, Manuel Munoz. Last but certainly not least, and because, um, you know, given the times, well, just given life in general, I think it is always a great thing if one can go out on poetry. So with that in mind, I'd like to present our final reader for the evening, Carl Phillips, who's the author of several books of poetry, including Pale Colors in the Tall Field, which was published this year, Silver Chest, which was a finalist for the International Griffin Prize, and Double Shadow, winner of the LA Times Book Prize for Poetry, and the finalist for the National Book Award. He's been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and teaches at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, we recently published uh, some of his poetry in Zizibar number 116. To please welcome Carl Phillips. Thanks, Oscar. Um, and thanks to all my fellow readers. It's been terrific hearing everybody. And um, it's a real honor to have had some work published in Zizifa. And so I'm gonna read, I, I'm gonna read three poems and the first two are the two that were in the magazine. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, the magazine. So this is called Fixed Shadow Moving Water. One friend tells me everything's political. Another says, nothing is, we just make it political. By we, he means human beings, I assume. What's political to a fox curled in sleep or a pond or a sycamore in winter with no leaves left to stop the snow falling through it? I have loved you for less time than I have loved some others, but none more deeply than you. No one more absolutely, which, as if inevitably amounts to a hierarchy of sorts, doesn't it? Value, then the power that comes with it. Soon enough, the distribution of power, who gets to do the distributing. But if we can make of tenderness a countervailing force, the two of us, if we can make from tenderness a revolution. This poem is called Little Shields in Starlight. Maybe there's no need for us to go anywhere more far than here, said the dogwood leaves, mistaking speech for song to the catalpa leaves, imitating silence. It was like sex when push the tenderness to either side of it, it's just sex, hardly sex at all. Hardly worth mentioning, except forgetting seems so much a shame lately. And why shouldn't there be records, however small, of our having felt something without for once having to name it? I know what my dirt is, as if that were enough, might well even have to be. 
to have moved mostly with the best intentions at least before we stopped. That's all that happens, I think. We stop moving forever. And I'm going to finish with a poem from the book Oscar mentioned, Pale Colors in a Tall Field. It's called, On Being Asked to Be More Specific When It Comes to Longing. When the forest ended, so did the star flowers and wild ginger that for so long had kept us company. The clearing opened before us, a vast meadow of silverrod, each stem briefly an angled argument against despair, then only weeds by a better name again, as incidental as the backdrop the ocean made just beyond the meadow. Like taking a horse whip to a swarm of bees that they might more easily disperse, we'd at last reach the point in twilight where twilight seems most a bowl designed to turn routinely, but as if by accident, half roughly over. Bells somewhere, the kind of bells that before being housed finally in their towers used to have to be baptized. Each was given to swing by or fall hushed inside of, accordingly, its own name. Bells, and then from the smudged edge of all that seemed to be left of what we called belief once, bodies not of hunting birds, what we thought at first, but human bodies in flight, in flight and lit from within as if by ruin or triumph maybe at having made out of ruin a light, something useful by which having skimmed the water to search the meadow now for ourselves inside it, where yes, though we shook in our nakedness, we lay naked as we have been taught to do. When afraid, what is faith? but to make a gift of yourself. Give, and you shall receive. Thanks. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Carl. Thank, thank you, you so much. And um, again, th thank you to everyone, uh, Carl, Manuel, Jessica, Anthony, uh, uh, Charlie, uh, for being part of what Zizava has been uh, trying to do over the past uh, 35 years. And by that, I mean um, uh, trying to uh, find the best uh, contemporary American literature, literature from abroad as well, that we can and putting it forth, uh, you know, for our readers. And not only that, but also just sort of, I guess, creating a space where people such as yourselves, uh, with such, if I may say, brilliance, um, can be in conversation with each other um, in, a, in, a, in a way that I think that, that makes literary journals special. Um, it's a very intimate experience, I think. And this is why I think they're so, they're so crucial, not just in the sense of, this is a way of also supporting writers and hopefully you go from emerging to established, but just to get back to, I think what it is that writing is all about, that connection of trying to find someone who will, is receptive to your voice and that this can make a difference in somebody's life. I think that is 